Thanks for joining us for the Long Island Sound Podcast. Each week we explore new music and dive deeper with the artists and their stories behind the music. Please subscribe and rate and review us wherever you stream this podcast. Here's your host, Steve Yusko. You are in store for a fantastic episode. I tell you, I feel really blessed. This uh, episode really touched my heart and it features Nancy Atlas, who has to be one of the hardest working uh, artists uh, on Long Island. She's got such notable music. It's hard to pin her down to a genre. But I tell you, I learned so much about the hard work and professionalism that she uh, puts into her work, her art. And she's got a great backstory. She's played with so many famous musicians, including Jimmy Buffett. And I'm going to let you find out the list of people that she's played with. And uh, I'm telling you, uh, the other thing I really enjoyed about the interview, which I think you will, is she was so transparent about her life, recent struggles that she's overcome, and she's always continued with the music and to entertain us. So let's take a listen to her song, Lost Highway.
Hi, this is Steve Yusko from the Long Island Sound Podcast. And I tell you, I feel I'm getting chills right now. I've, I'm serious. I feel so blessed to have Nancy Atlas on the, on the, uh, the podcast. Um, I've been chasing Nancy down for a couple of months. Um, and But I got to tell you this. I went to see Gene Casey and Nancy Atlas out at the Bay Street Theater. And if there's one thing anyone's got to put on their bucket list is to see Nancy Atlas live. And uh, it was just an energetic. Wow. And, and there she is. Up to this. <laughs> <laughs> Without further ado, welcome to the Long Island Sound Podcast, man. Ba 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 da ba. Wow, that's quite an intro, Steve. I hope I can. Uh, I, can I hope I can follow through with all of this. Thank you so I, much. I, I have. I have no doubt. And uh, you know, I was reading your bio, and it's. Uh, so I live. I live in the middle of the Long Island. For those who are listening, Nancy's on the East End. East End is such a special place. It's it's hard to extra, uh, describe. It's a little bit of New England. It's uh, a little bit of celebrities out there who rush out there in the summertime or who are now, I think, out there full time after COVID. So there's a whole different vibe, whether you're on the North Fork or the South Fork. But the one thing that's really cool, and I say this all the time, is the wellspring of music that exists on Long Island in all these different genres. So I will say even though I'm in Babylon, I'm discovering the East End. And uh, and I knew about Nancy and uh, connected uh, to Nancy through Jean. And uh, I don't know, it's just been great. So seeing you live, I don't have to speculate about hearing your music. Uh, I lived it and uh, had a great time at the Bay Street Theater. Anyway, I'm chatting too much. Nancy, one of the things that in looking at your bio, um, I found it extremely interesting that you spend time uh, – in college in Europe, I believe, and you picked up a guitar, and, you, and from what I recall, you haven't looked back. So I'm interested in how you got the bug for music, and did it come naturally? Is something you worked at, your musical family? Where did it really start for you as far as music? You know, I started, um, my, my, my journey started, the first rec like the first cognizant memory that I have is about three, sitting oh. at a piano. We had an upright, an old upright piano. I grew up in Comac. Uh, I'm a Comac girl, Comac North, although it, I was the last year where uh, North and South merged. Anyway, um, and I would play at the piano, and somewhere around 10 or 11, my mom insisted that I take uh, some lessons for a year. Okay. And I kicked and I fought because I had it in my <laughs> head that if I learned how to do it properly, I would lose this magical connection that I had to hearing things. I could hear, um, I could, I could hear music and then play it, not like on a prodigy level, but mm -hmm. just I could clunk it out, you know, or I could feel it out. Um, in addition to that, I also played viola and cello for about 10 years through from first grade on through about 10th grade in high school. And so I always, I kind of had that musical background. I did a year of piano and I immediately started writing songs. So oh, wow. the second, second marker that I would say in my life is that in seventh and eighth grade, I was for the talent show performing original songs with my girlfriend singing harmony behind it. I, there was, you know, five or six girls. And so if I look back at my life, uh, I was me, I was already a songwriter. Um, but I was heavily involved in art, which is what I went to college for. So mm -hmm. I, I studied fine art and painting and all of that and art history. And it wasn't until I graduated college um, I had always wanted to play guitar. It kind of had eluded me. I just, it was never an instrument. I had talked about it, I played a little sax, the violin. Like I was always dabbling. Right, and sure. Then, and then uh, I was in the last, literally, I think it was the last few weeks of, of college. I was studying overseas. I was in London. I was super depressed. Mm. It was uh, the recession. It was 91. Okay. Um, I couldn't get a job to save my life in advertising or, and I, I didn't have that, that feeling in my stomach that I could fight for it, which you have to have as an artist. Sure. Right. And then I'm uh, sorry, I'll wrap this up. But, um, 
<laughs> I, I went I went down to Portobello Road and I had sixty quid, which is like a hundred bucks, and I I bought a used guitar. I came home and a Mel Bay book, and I kn I knew immediately I could die for it. I was like, wow. oh, I could die for this, and I never I never looked back. I really did. I I my, my parents are like, could you have not figured this out before you went to college for <laughs> you know so uh, yeah. But, you know but you know what it is? You, you figure it out, Nancy. What, what I find really fascinating, especially for any of us who took piano, I was a frustrated uh, piano student. Mrs. Wallace, I still remember her today. And I, 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 if I ever hear the song Itsy Bitsy Spider and I had to play it and had all the, the check marks because <laughs> I didn't. Taranta, I didn't, what's the, yes, go ahead, sorry. <laughs> I, didn't do it, I didn't do it right. But a couple of things kind of strike me, uh, two things. One, uh, the cross between being uh, a visual artist, uh, appreciating uh, the visual arts and the performing arts. And, and I've run into that a few times with guests. But what I also find fascinating is that voice in your head to hear music and maybe have the skill of an early development of your ear, which is something many of us work out after we pick up the instrument to train our ears and progress with that. So. Um, that gives you a leg up in my book as far as being able to adapt, particularly when you're on stage and you're working with other musicians and you're communicating and going that direction. So, I've been very lucky, though. My, the band, you know, my band was together for 27 years. It's a long time. Oh my gosh. Uh, probably one of, without a doubt, the thing that I'm most kind of proud of is keeping a band together for that long. But some some things, they I give them the bones of the song and they – they can feel it out and they have that kind of palette to create musically with. And then there's quite a few songs that I will hear in my head fully completed in, in, in a sense of, you know, the tagline or the bass or so, like I, I, I hear things. So it's kind of a 50, 50 split. And I think it's kind of probably one of the reasons that the guys have stayed uh, so long is because I would hope that they feel uh, that they've had that palette, that artistic palette, the bones. I'm a songwriter. I, I'm a I'm a singer as a byproduct of being a songwriter. Okay. So, you know, it's like the chicken, what came first? The song definitely comes first for me. And I, I didn't even plan on being a singer ever, ever, never, <laughs> never. I tried, but I went to a few open mics and, and no one would sing my songs. So I said, oh, shit, I'm going to have to sing. And right. And it just kind of, um, it happened uh, very organically. And Johnny Blood was at one of those open mics and who's my lead guitarist uh, okay. and, a, his own, and a phenomenal guitarist in his own right outside of me. He plays with Gene and many, many other people. But um, he kind of took me under his wing and Brett King on bass, Richard Rosh on drums for many years. Nice. Uh, so let, me ask, so let me ask you this as far as, now being early into the ability to write songs, do you consider yourself a sole practitioner when you're developing the songs? I know you talked about the palette and how your project, your uh, the Nancy Atlas project, I think it's called, right? How they uh, choose these different colors and help uh, spice up or give influence to the song. But when it comes to writing itself, are, are you a sole practitioner? Do you work with anybody else on lyrics per se, or is it really just you putting out that song and then developing it further on? You know, I try, I've tried collaboration and I used to, and I'm not saying that I wouldn't, mm -hmm. um, but songwriting for me is really a form of therapy at its best um, and, and deeply, deeply personal. And I used to feel bad about being a soul practitioner, as you would say, or right. writing on my own. Uh, I don't feel bad about it anymore. Um, my, I really enjoy the process. Um, I, I'm a, a more kind of a wordsmith. Like you know, there's there's different camps where you can can get a hook and 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 the hit and everything like that. And I, trust me, I listen to that stuff all day long. I love a good hit song. Um, but where I get off and where I love it is the lyrics. So. Uh, for me, a well-crafted song that kind of has a twist and a turn, um, people that I love and admire and have been mentors in my own life are like Tom Petty or mm -hmm. Lucinda Williams. Um, obviously, everyone loves Bob Dylan. You know, his, these are these are the the kind of heavyweights. 
But sure. that is kind of the church that I go to. For me, it's really about the lyrics. Um, I, lo I love a good twist. So, hmm. yeah. So, so you've been writing for a number of years. Has anything really changed in how you approach songwriting? I mean, we all change, right? You know, whether, you know, you go through marriage and have kids and stuff and the dynamic in the household change. How has that affected or not affected your songwriting uh, ability over the years? Having children? Yeah, let's go there. I have three kids. Um, love my kids. Um, you know, I think it's a state of mind if you really want my opinion on that um anyone that has a child or any i mean like life is busy right you don't have to have sure. kids to be distracted you work uh, you could i always find that people say oh with kids well life is i find, i think if i didn't have kids i would still be very distracted i'm just that <laughs> kind of person i always need to go 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 right um, right but but having three children who i definitely have prioritized in my life good with my you. husband thomas um, I'm going to say at the end of the day right now has made me a better songwriter and surfer and, and because oh. you can only do one of two things. You can be frustrated and you can, um, be angry that you have no more time or you will prioritize your craft or your joy and you will still get to it. Um, you know, I was somebody that when I was waiting tables, I was writing songs as I was setting up the catch-ups and the thing. I mean, I specifically <laughs> took a waiting, waitressing job where I was the only waitress um, right. at the corner. I had run restaurants for when I was younger to get through college. And I was very almost going into a whole different career with restaurant, uh, being a manager and stuff like that. And so when, when my career started taking off, I just said, I, I can't do, I can't manage a restaurant and be a musician, but I can wait. And so my point is that it's all about putting the blinders on. And so mm. with my children, um, yes, I have not gone on the road as much. I've, I've gotten, I've taken less jobs, but I've, they've been better. You don't, can I swear on this? Am I allowed to yeah. swear? <laughs> Hell yeah. You don't have time for the bullshit. All right. And so gotcha. it's like, you know, when you're jumping in, if you only got an hour to surf because X, Y, and Z is in line, you, you're going to go in that water independent of whether the tide is going in or out or the waves are working. And, and I guess that's the thing is that it makes you better. I, you know, I don't mean to to paint this cheery picture, of course, I've been highly frustrated along the way, but um, it's all a state of mind, I guess. Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny when you when you bring the water imagery into my mind, and it, it's uh, analogous to life, the ebb and tide of the tide, you know, in and out, the ups and downs of of uh, uh, approaching life and approaching music. But it's it's what what clicks into my mind is is making that time um, and dedicating, and and you get. I'm, this is my assumption. I think you get wired that way over time to kind of go into that place and, and be able to be able to write. Hey, let's do this. Let's just take a quick break. I want to talk about the song that our audience heard leading into the podcast. I want to get your take on, man, this crazy music business. And uh, I want to talk about the East End because I have I have some thoughts on it. And I need you to clarify them for me. So, I'll do um, my best. I'll do my best, Steve. <laughs> hey, everybody. We'll be right back with the wonderful, fantastic Nancy Atlas. Stay tuned. At the Long Island Sound, we're much more than a podcast. We're building a community. Please go to gigdestiny.com. Check out all our social media links. Subscribe wherever you listen to the podcast. Please comment. Call the listener line. Tell us what you think, what questions we should ask, who we should have on the show. And most of all, we thank you for your generous support. And remember, support the artists who are guests on the show. Now back to the podcast. Hey, everybody. We're back with Nancy Atlas. There's so much to explore here. Nancy, I want to jump into um, the fact that you live on the East End. And, uh, you know, from my perspective, you know, the East End is, is really a magical place. And let's talk about the South Fork, the Hamptons and and Montauk and Amagansett and stuff like that. Beautiful beaches, you know, the, the old uh, 
uh, saying it's a uh, it's a, a, a drinking village with a fishing problem or something like, <laughs> something yeah. like that. That's and it my has, dog. Yeah, and it has changed uh, over the years, but there's some really great uh, places out there. How is it that you came to be in uh, out east? And um, tell me about your experience with that, and are there changes in the musical scene, that sort of thing? Uh, my parents bought a, my father was an engineer for Grumman for years and my mother okay. worked at Stony Brook. Um, and he bought, they bought a house out in Lazy Point when I was seven. I used to camp at Heather Hills. Oh, and great. so every summer or every weekend you talk about, you know, a small village with a, a, the drinking, <laughs> the fishing, the fishing. My father was a passionate, passionate fisherman. That was his love. Um, outside of engineering. And so we were always coming out. Um, when I graduated from college, and it's interesting, I was just writing about this. Okay. Um, it, there was no question that I would come out. It, it called to me. And so um, I was never a city mouse. I was always a country mouse. I like okay. the solitude. I've always been a lone wolf. I don't need to hang out at I love a good party, but I don't need it. I'm very content by myself. And so- gotcha. As an artist, I, I drew off of the landscape on the East End. It, 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 it fit with the style. I, I go fishing. I like to surf, all of those things. So I've lived in just about every town out here. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's changed. It changed dramatically in COVID because everybody right. came out to their summer houses and lived year-round. And so right. – um, but I think that it's, it's, it's finding its way, you know, the streets are a little more quiet right now. It was a good two year run of that. Um, and it was a very bizarre dynamic, Steve, because a musician usually is looking for, um, the intake of people coming in in the summer that you have a big crush. So you're playing to new people, you know, it's living out right. here is this too. It's very d weird dynamic. You have your people that follow you all year long, right? Right. And then in the summer, you're playing to hundreds of people that have never seen you that might just be going out to the surf lodge or the talk house or whatever. Right, right. And so yeah. here we have hundreds of thousands of people that have moved out to the East End and no ability to make live music because of COVID. Right. So it was really bizarre. Uh, I did not enjoy it. I don't pretend to enjoy it. I didn't. I wasn't one of these people that was a highly prolific in the uh, pandemic. Yeah, during the quarantine, yeah. You know, my big joke is that I became a 1950s housewife, and, you know, <laughs> I understand why they were alcoholics. Was, no, but I, I literally was making dinner and just keeping things very stable for my children. Because sure. Because the world was upside down. Yep. So, uh, yeah. Um, but the music scene, uh, if you, if you want to talk about that, I think we have a very, very real, genuine uh scene out here mm -hmm. with very very talented people all across the board so right you know yeah. that's important I, I remember i interviewed uh you may know the guys i'm sure a band called out east yes i yes i don't know them but i know of them yeah, yeah they, they're great in fact one of their guys and barrios is a luthier um just a really nice guy uh, I interviewed them uh, about six months ago. It was pretty neat. I want to talk about Stevens Talk House, not just because it has my name involved with it. One, I've never been there. Uh, I'm dying to get in there. What? <laughs> I, yeah, I know, right? Can you believe it? I'm 61 years old. I pass it with great envy going, yeah, someday. <laughs> Steve, am I going to get your Stephen Talk House cherry? Is that what's going to happen here? I'm playing <laughs> April 22nd, dog. Oh, yeah? You gotta All make right. that happen. I'll, I'll make it. I will make no it. No excuses. No excuses. What, what day? What day of the week is it? Saturday night. Oh, that I can do. Because I'm not working night. the next day. April twenty second. <laughs> That's going to be a really kick ass show too. So I, I only say that not as someone who's cocky. It's just that we have a, a, a kick and bam that night. <laughs> All right. Hey, you know what? The other thing is in in doing my my homework on you, I'm like, holy shit. And I, I got to go. I just got to go down this list because I went through that slideshow that you have on your website. I don't which even is, know, but OK. Well, I'm going to tell I'm going to remind you. It's called, by the way, it's Nancy com, And you could also find at Nancy Atlas on Twitter and other social media. So, yeah. Instagram is the one I use the most. Inst at Instagram. Yeah. We can talk about that. That's pretty interesting. But let me just let me just throw out the list. 
okay? Dave Mason, Lucas Nelson. We got to talk about him because I, I saw uh, uh, Promise of the Real with Neil Young at Jones Beach, and they brought an energy to Neil Young a few years ago that was unbelievable. He's Patty phenomenal. Smith, Bonnie Raitt, uh, you know, just, just got a Grammy. God bless her. Lucinda Williams, Uptown Horns, Coco Montoya, Elvis Costello, Jimmy Buffett. I think I've heard that name before. Uh, John, <laughs> Sorry. Joan Osborne, Taylor, the late Taylor Hawkins, uh, who you said sweats music, I think was the quote, <laughs> under Clarence Clemens, Paul Simon, which I think has a residency out east, Chad Smith, yes. Brett King, and G.E. Smith, I think, who may be out there as well. How the heck does a Comac girl get to play beside or with these people? I'm, in, I'm intrigued. I, I want to know. Because if I ever come back uh, and reincarnated in life, I got to figure this out and hopefully remember it. Um, you know, we've estimated that my bands probably play between thirty-five and four thousand shows in the last twenty Holy something crap. years. Wow! Um, and I would say that the answer to that is is like a two-pronged answer. Okay. The first part of that, undeniably, would be that Peter Honerkamp from the Stephen Talk House believed in what I was doing and what we were mm. doing and supported that by putting us in the position to follow or to open for those bands. Um, wow. And, and so... Um, that, 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 that can't be denied. You know, the, the, a chunk of that list, definitely. We were the house band for the Stephen Talk House for 16 years, which oh. means to all of your listeners that we played from 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. Many, 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 many times Friday <laughs> and Saturday night. Oh my so God. I would get home at 5 a.m., sleep, pull a waitress shift, and then go to work again and play a whole nother show until 5 a.m. in the morning in my youth before I had children. Wow. And actually, well into having children. It wasn't until I had my third child and I was uh, about, hold on, let me think about this, eight years ago is when I put my my staff down and said, no more, I can't do this. I, I, it's just too much. But um, so that's the first answer. And then, okay. the, and then the second answer is a little bit sensitive for me. Can I keep going here? I don't want to yeah. ramble. No, no, this is wonderful. Um, a lot of people will always say, oh, you're so lucky <laughs> that you get to do what you do. Yeah. And, you know, I am. I am very lucky. Um, I am lucky that I have. Uh, yeah. But I also I worked my ass off. Right. I mean, and and I we have played, my band has played thousands of shows like we are going to die that night and so if yeah. there's any young musicians listening my number one piece of advice is you are only as good as your last show and you've got to bring it and i do feel give or take the random shows you know i i i play every show like i'm gonna die or i try to the sure. next day and yep. I, very often I will look to my right and I'll see Johnny and I'll look to my left and I'll see Brett and I'll try to be very, very present to that moment. That's not to say that things don't go wrong and you don't have bad situations or that, you know, things happen. But, and I think that, that, that is the answer when someone like Jimmy Buffett calls you to back them up, um, yeah. which I, we've backed up Jimmy many times through the years for wounded warrior or through, okay. You know, if he comes and sits in on shows when we're lucky in the summer, I he is the most amazing, generous man. I mean, he let me sit in with him at Jones Beach. Wow. Who has a, he has a huge Rolodex, okay, outside of <laughs> Shinnecock. Not a lot of people know who I am. Uh, and so for him, that's a perfect example of the type of person he is to invite me to sit in with him at Jones Beach I, can you imagine that gift? I mean, now, it's just... You know you know what? You bring up a good point, and, and I just want to circle back to that, oh, you're so lucky statement, because that can be a, pejor a pejorative statement in that you're privileged and, and you know, 
Uh, I wish I was lucky like you. And you bring up a good point about a couple of things, and I've, I've learned this over the, the past year, about making the most of opportunities uh, that you have. One, honing your craft and being good. But the other thing that ties into me, and it's, I'm getting a little chills too now, is um, is being present. And as I get older, I, I keep reminding myself just in life to be present to people in conversation because I got accused of, you know, hey, you're not listening or whatever. And it's like, God, you know what? I can't be distracted. I'm with you right now. And I would assume that's the same way on stage. Hey, you know what? I'm present to the audience. I'm present to my bandmates. And that's where it all kind of comes together. And then you throw passion, hard work. And you know what? Playing like it's, it's like living like it's your last day on earth. Playing like it's your last day on earth brings an extra bit of energy uh, to whatever you're doing. And that's evident. And I think people like Buffett and other people see that saying, I love that. That's what I do. I want that on stage. Or well, also when they stage. sit in, yeah. you know, yeah. when they sit in, it's an honor. And so I'm always shocked at how some of, sometimes these bands, they just, they show up late and so it's like, no, man, you know, yes, it's an art form, but it's also a job. And, and so when you're consistent, if, if you get that chance to have that person sit in with your band, you have to honor that and you have to be ready. Yeah. And so, and by doing that, then they want to hopefully do that again. When yeah. we played with, Taylor Hawkins, that was a call from Chad Smith, who had played with us many, 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 many times. Taylor okay. was in town. And, you know, we basically said, I want to play with my friend. Can you put something together? And so, you know, that's a call that took 25 years in the making, though. Sure. Right. That's a call where I'm calling Clark Gayton, who is the trombone player for Springsteen. I'm calling, you know, uh, Johnny Blood and I'm uh, Cliff Black, who is another legend on the East End. And I'm making sure that that band is so tight right. that when they get up there, um, there's no they want to fly because, you know, you, you raise that bar. Uh, if you have people sit in with them. This is another thing I've never understood with certain musicians. They're very so competitive. Um, oh, yeah, right. And it's like, I don't jibe with that because I don't really want to be anybody else. I mean, <laughs> right. I might look at Brandy Carlisle from time to time and be like, damn, she's <laughs> doing a well, well, well with Willie Nelson. But I love but her. Saying, I love her. I, I don't, you can't deny. You cannot deny Brandy Carlisle. I mean, she's just a once in a generation talent. But I'm saying I still don't want to be her. You know, I want right. to be me. And so. My point with that is when you get a chance to, whether they're famous or not, uh, some of the most amazing musicians I've ever played with, you wouldn't even know their name. You wouldn't even recognize them crossing the street, but the chops would sing. You want to lift them up. You yeah, know? Ex exactly. I, you know, you, you mentioned the bands who come in late and, and stuff like that. There's a certain smugness to that in that. And, and I get this feeling, you know, if, if you're, you're about to do any performance, any performance, and you don't have those butterflies uh, you know, like the butterflies aren't there, then you, you should kind of do some self-reflection and say, am I, bring, am I bringing it, you know? Am I bringing it for the audience, you know? Uh, and, uh, and, and bring them along. On, I use this tagline, I'm going to plug it, is let the music take you on a journey. And that puts a lot of responsibility on the performer and the artist to be that person that takes you along, that takes control, that, that drives it and, uh, and I can only speak as an audience member and say, you know, oh, my God, this is just amazing where they went. Oh, she's jumping to the piano. And I, I kind of key into and I, let's touch on this for a moment is uh, as I watch live shows now, I'm looking for the cues between each other. Uh, and I'll just tell you about a, a quick story. So <laughs> Tedeschi Trucks Band at the Beacon Theater and what was and we happened to get backstage passes because a friend of mine's brother-in-law is the guitar tech and the mixer for the for the band right go figure and what i did notice was so cool now derek truck's phenomenal right wife susan tedeschi as phenomenal yes but he can kind of get pulled into it and he kept on throwing the lead back to her and i just know it was very nuanced like no you take it I, no you go with it it was just really kind of neat to see that sharing 
you know, of, of the stage together. You know, it was, it was kind of neat. Anyway. Well, you want to see a great band do that. Check out Trombone Shorty the next time he's um, kicking through. They're okay. New Orleans band, very, very famous in, in uh, really worldwide now. But he plays trombone and he cues his band with hits of his elbow. It's phenomenal. <laughs> it's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. You're watching and you're like, oh, I think he just took them in there. Oh, my gosh, is it two? that he's like, you know, he's like, unbelievable. <laughs> hey, yeah, let's, well. Let's do this, not to cut you off, but I, yeah. you know, I'm going to do that from time to time and I've been accused of it. Let's talk about the next song as I puddle through my notes here that you brought to the table um which is east end run since we spoke about the east end that's appropriate just tell me a little bit about that song i never asked what it's written about but how did that come about uh and then we'll let the audience have a listen to it um my father who uh came to me and said you know you never write songs for me <laughs> and um so I wrote him a song, and that was the song East End Run. And it, um, it's a shanty. You know, one of the beautiful things, Steve, about not having, having your own record label is that you're free to write whatever you want. So sure. one of the things I'm probably guilty of is that sometimes I write Americana, sometimes I write rock and roll, which you'll hear later, um, hopefully if we can fit it in. And in this case, you're going to hear a sea shanty. But it encapsulates my youth uh, of living out here and also the joy and the beauty and the solitude and strength that I get off of the land and, 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 and the East End and why I live here, really. All right. Wonderful. All right. Let's check it out. We'll be right back after the song, everyone. Stick with us. Well, my father, he is a fisherman And my mama, she beats her own drum And they raised me up out in Lazy Point With the sand and the sea and the sun There was an old dirt road with no telephones And at night it would get kind of still And I can still recall the sound of it all right down to the lone river well these times are changing fast oh but i know what is true so let this world turn back cause that's when i turn to you the tides are calling fisherman's friend and all the boats go out to play there's a railroad track that is shiny and cracked and it runs out now peak way and if i close my eyes i can still hear the cry of that long whistling train these times are a change fast world turn mad cause that's when I turn to you the tides are a calling my name that red buoy bell is being wrong I'm leaving it all behind I'm making an east end run
was cooking at John's pancake house In the ditch which is brewing your coffee And George Watson's throwing some screaming kid out These times are changing fast Oh, but I know what is true So let this world turn back that's when I turn to you The ties are calling my name The red blue bells be head wrong I'm leaving it all behind I'm making an east and run I'm leaving it all Hey everybody, we're back with Nancy Atlas. Thank you so much for that song, Nancy. It was really wonderful. Oh, thank you. So you were going to say something about a particular instrument in that song. Well, I was just going to say it's not every day that you hear an accordion solo, but uh, and the accordion. I do love me some accordion, but Neil Surreal hits it out of the park on that one. And uh, it's not, it's not, it's a hard instrument to make cool, but he he does it, you know. He does it, so. That's great. That's wonderful. So let's talk about this. I'm really interested, and I've seen, I've seen kind of diversity among artists, uh, usually older artists who, um, you know, are used to putting out full albums, uh, and now there's a big trend to doing EPs, you know, two or three songs, kind of feeding your audience uh, and keeping them engaged. And then there's a social media aspect to it. Uh, I'll just mention these guys because I think they're great. The Como brothers um, sound like the Everly brothers, by the way. And they seem to churn out songs like every two weeks. Wow. And uh, they, uh, Tatiana is, I think, Matt's fiance, And she does, she does the videos on her iPhone. And, you know, they'll throw, they'll throw a video out. And then they'll throw the video out with lyrics. And uh, they just... Uh, they're, they're kind of one of the spotlights as far as well. It's interesting that they've got it figured out. But things in the industry is, have really changed. And I wanted to get your take on things. Sure. I think one of the, uh, the hardest things about being an independent uh, professional musician is the amount of hats okay. that you have to wear. Um, and everything takes energy. And everything takes time. And so you're referencing this other band and it's wonderful if you have people that are getting involved and social media absolutely helps. It's, it's unquestionable that right. getting the word out would um, is easier and, and that Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, or whatever your, your, uh, <laughs> whatever platform. your Troy platform is. Yeah. But I think that it's, you know, for me, it's incredibly sensitive because I got very sick last fall with Lyme disease mm -hmm. and um, basically annihilated about six months of my life wow. and, and severely sick, severely sick. It was misdiagnosed as long COVID and oh. it wasn't until the point where I couldn't walk and I was slurring and I was having neurop severe neuropathy. And so my point of mentioning that at all is, first of all, take getting bit by a tick very seriously and take your doxycycline immediately or see a doctor. But right. secondly, secondly is that, you know, when you're younger and we we're talking about the talk house years, mm -hmm. your, your energy is finite, uh, right. infinite, infinite, sorry. Infinite. 
infinite. You can just wake up and waitress and go and go and go and go. But now as I'm getting older, I, I, and especially after this about round of uh, being sick, which is I'm still tripping over my words. That's partly with Lyme disease because it got very severe. Um, is that my energy is finite. And so like I, I have the ability to only do so much. Right. And for me, that is performing live and that is writing songs. Now we are well past due for a recording. I think our last album was seven years ago, Okay, maybe even longer than that. Um, and we have a solid, solid album that, I mean, I've got the songs, right. but it's just like how for, for 30 years, it's like, okay, you take off this hat and you put on the producer hat. And then, and you know, even people like John Cleary uh, from New Orleans, who I'm such a huge fan of, that's J-O-N, John Cleary, phenomenal, phenomenal musician. He won a Grammy for um, kind of a authentic Louisiana music. He's just killer. And he was saying like, that's all well and good, but I still got to raise the money to get the recording. I still got to, you know, do all these things. And I think that, that is probably the one part of it all that becomes exhausting. You still got to do it. Right. You don't want to complain. You're not picking up garbage every day. I mean, you know, every job is hard, so you might as well do something you love. But when people just see the playing of live music is the easy part, it's right. all the other stuff that make being a professional musician incredibly um, challenging. And so my hat's off to all of my fellow professional, my hat's off to the Gene Casey's and the Andy Aladorts and the Winston Irie and the Inda Eaton's and the Caroline Dr. Rose and all of my fellow professional musicians, because, you know, all that said, Steve, mm -hmm. it's still worth it. Yeah. You know, what's interesting is, and uh, I, uh, in interviewing people and finding those musicians that are become full-time musicians, let's say professional musicians. And, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you survive, you know, financially? Uh, you're not going to make it off of streams unless you just, it, it hits right. Okay. So they're, they're making it through, through doing gigs and festivals and, and getting out there and merchandise too, which is an interesting where there's Patreon and there's other avenues to do that. But how many, I can't tell you how many times, uh, it's the same story of, of musicians who reach that crossroads where they really love what they do, but I got to survive and I've got to do the day job or something else, you know, to, they reach that, that crossroads. The great thing is if you stick with the music, you can always play music and play with your friends, but it's, that's, that's the difficulty, uh, that, that I think is out there. Um, and I think a lot of the people who listen to this podcast, you know, recognize, appreciate the tips that you're giving and, and the passion that you have. For your music and and i give my hat off too to those who are able to follow their dream and be persistent even through the ebbs and tides or back to the surfing aspect of it uh the ebb and tide of life and and music itself is 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 kind of interesting so uh, well how do you also form a following and you have to be open to that i mean you saw a bay street show which isn't exactly our band yet um, our band right. is a different beast. Um, when people say, how would you define it? It's kind of like an Americana, but then I also have some rock and roll in there and sure. I, I love a good ballad with the rest of them. So, but the thing that makes our show and our, our following so, um, special, I would hope is that it is a bit of a tribe. So when you come, no show is the same, um, exactly right. the same. I mean, we might play so, but I, my, there's a big joke in my band that I write a set list for every single show and I never follow it because <laughs> when you get into a room, there is the energy of the people. And right. so the best shows are like, you know, this giant circle. I'm repeat. I've definitely said this before, mm -hmm. but what was fascinating about the post COVID or however you want to define it about the summer last year was that I came out, I came out swinging with some new stuff right. and people wanted nostalgia. They wanted nostalgic music last year. It was like they wanted to be brought back 
to 2019. They wanted the petty and the stones and the, you know. Yeah. And so it wasn't really a great year for breaking out new music. I'll tell you that much. At least that was my experience. And musicians that are in that journey tribute band or whatever, they're phenomenal musicians. Oh, absolutely. And there is there is this very fine line where you have to fight constantly for your original music and it is so hard. I mean, it's it's just it's hard and it's not hard, right? You have you have to do it. And I think that's one thing that I've definitely been cognizant of and fought for. I mean, we played late night at the talk house for years and we absolutely did, I'd say 75% or 60% of covers, but we did 40 or 35% of originals. And it, right. you can't get people singing your originals unless you play them, but you can't get people coming if you're an unknown. It's like this, it's a, every, every professional it's musician out there knows what I'm talking about. And yeah. so, and so it's this fight. It's this fight that is worth it, but I get very, um, I get very snotty about it because a lot of times <laughs> people say, you know, if you're coming to a show now at the talk house, sometimes like, we want to dance and I'm like, well, go to a fucking dance hall then. Like, you know what I mean? Like I just spent a year and a half working on this song called the bottle is your bride. And I'm all for having upbeat music. I love upbeat music too. I write it, but most musicians I know love all of it. Right. They love a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And so, um, you know, finding that platform to play it and the bars, which look, they're getting people to come in. If, if it's a Friday night or a Saturday night and they're, and they're packing the place out, that band's going to get hired again. And so exactly. if it's a tribute band, it's, it's just a juggle right now. But, right. um, it's just just a recognized not to get in, into that rut and, you know, always promoting original music, you know, because uh, they'll never know it if you don't play it. Exactly. And, you and know, this, so, you know, this gives us a good lead in to a cover song you did called Joe only King. two in my life have I covered Wild Horses, which is also uh, with uh, my dear friend Randy Fischenfeld on violin oh, wow. and and Jolene and uh, she's. I think is she on that Jolene? I can't remember. No, no, no. I don't think she is. Um, Johnny Bud. But we did a slowed down uh, rendition of it that um, came from hearing um, what was it? Bruce Springsteen. Somebody slowed down Jolene mm. to thirty, like some, like you know, thirty-three beats per minute, okay. and it sounded like Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> and I, I listened to it. I was like. Oh, damn, yeah, that's how I'm going to do it. So nice. this is our take on Jolene. Thank All you, right. Dolly Parton. <laughs>
Okay. Hey, everybody. We're back with Nancy Atlas. That was really a great cover of Jolene. Uh, I love that song, but I really love your version of that A little dark and dirty. A little dark and dirty. <laughs> Just like my martinis, the way I like it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let's talk about the fourth song that you brought to the table, Shotgun Jesus. Now, what's interesting and what I love about you is you can't be pinned down to any particular genre, which opens up the world as far as a fan and a listener uh, to me. Tell me about uh, Shotgun Jesus, and we'll have our audience have a listen to it. Well, we earlier in the interview, we had mentioned I grew up in Comac, and I don't know if there's a Long Island thing, but riding shotgun is, yeah, oh, yeah. you know, front seat. I, don't, I think that's probably not independent of Long Island. But yeah. um, so, you know, you call shotgun, even my kids call shotgun all the time. <laughs> And I have a 1969 Cadillac um, DeVille a convertible and called the Midnight Rambler. And I love cars. And he is, without a doubt, one of my favorite things in life. He's on the cover uh, of our last album. Nice. And um, so <laughs> the feeling that I get driving him is that when, and I'm not even a heavily religious person, it's not about the physical shotgun. And, and, and they, but it's like, I feel like I got a shotgun Jesus riding by my side. And so, um, the car is all about the, the song is all about my Cadillac, my, my 1969. Nice. Cadillac. So in, in, instead of Jesus taking the wheel, Jesus is riding shotgun. He's riding shotgun. And it, it talks about the feeling that I get riding a car. And it's, it's a driving rock song. A lot of fun when we play it live, we usually will end the show with it. Um, it's always a joy when we have backup singers as well. Um, on April 22nd, we'll play in the Talk House, and we will have Greg McMullen sitting in with us on Pedal Steel, Ooh, nice. um, which is going to be a blast. But yeah, it's a little bit more rock and roll, and it is a big joy when you don't have the pressures of a label uh, to be able to write whatever comes through your receptors. You Excellent. Know? All right, so let's take a listen to Shotgun Jesus. We'll be right back.
We're back with Nancy Atlas. Nancy, it's been a whirlwind ride in this episode. I really appreciate uh, your time and uh, really- Thank you for uh, having me. Thank you very much for having thanks. me. And I'm gonna be there and I'm gonna encourage people to go to Stephen's Talk House on April 22nd. It's a Saturday. And I end my podcast from a good friend of mine, Bob Murray told me, he said, you know, Steve, uh, you can account for the things in your bank, the things you own. And as we know, especially when we get knocked down, we can't always account for the days we have left here on earth. So the fact that you gave me your time, Nancy, uh, it's appreciated and a blessing. So great to have you. Oh, that's so heartfelt and appreciated. And it was a joy. Um, I look forward to uh, a continued friendship here. And thank you Excellent. so much for taking the time to spread the good word about original music on Long Island. Appreciate it and beyond. You, you got it, dear. Be well, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I appreciate the time you spent with us. Please subscribe and comment and visit us at gigdestiny.com. Till next time, be generous with your joy, keep your spirits high, and let the music take you on a journey. Be well. Peace.